at the Church's Conservation Trust. It really is um, wonderful to be talking to you all um, once again. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, um, again, a warm welcome to you. Please do comment away. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know if this is your first time. But to all of our regular viewers, please also do let us know where you're watching from. Um, as is always the custom, um, our lectures are completely free of charge. So if you happen to see anyone comment at all with this throughout this lecture, telling you to go and watch a lecture elsewhere, please do not click those links. And if anyone asks for card details, please never, ever give your credit card or debit card details over. Our lectures are always 100% free of charge to watch and enjoy. Now, as is the custom, the first 10 minutes of these lectures, we do what we call Church of the Week. So I'm going to pass you over to our Chief Executive, Peter Rez, who's going to tell you what today's church is. And um, yeah, over to you, Peter. Thank you, George. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to say you might notice my background is a bit different today because for the first time since August, I'm actually sitting in my office, which is a, an incredible thing to do. So I'm pleased to bring you Church of the Week from the CCT offices in, in London, and it's good to be here. So this week's church, uh, very kindly sponsored by Ecclesiastical, is St John the Baptist. Clan Rothel. Uh, the reason we've chose this uh, is because uh, it's the nearest we could get to Wales in our collection, I think, uh, in name and geography as well, I think. So St John the Baptist Clan Rothel is a church with saintly connections. It's difficult to picture Clan Rothel Church surrounded by houses, yet so it was until at least the time of the Black Death, 1348 to 49. Archaeologists have found evidence to prove it. A road ran nearby and a mill stood by the river. Then all disappeared and the church stands as lonely today as the original Christian structure must have done when first erected by the Celtic hermit saint Hrodel, of whom practically nothing is known, some 1300 or 1400 years ago. In 1851, the vicar of Lanrothal, the Reverend John D. Watherstone, conducted services at 11am and 3pm every Sunday. That was the beginning of his, at the beginning of his incumbency. In 1882, the old parish church was closed and no service was held there in any regular way. Of the building that existed in 1186, only the north wall of the nave, together with one window, remains. The font may also be of this date. Most of the rest of the church dates from the end of the 13th century and the beginning of the 14th. The structure that dominated Lanrothal village when the Black Death struck was comparatively new. The chancel arch, demolished in 1948, was one of the late 13th or early 14th century and was built of tufa. The replacement arch was built in 1958 in brick, as you can see here, which is a, a curious demise to what would have been a very interesting uh, chancel arch. That's uh, pretty brutal, the brick that comes through. The massive medieval altar stone, as you can see here, is said to weigh two tonnes and it was found under the floor of the church when it was reseated in about 1890. The altar cross and candlesticks, together with the chandelier, were given to the church by Ivor Bulmer Thomas, who was the first chairman of the church's conservation trust and absolutely instrumental in setting us up. The four-sided pulpit is Jacobean, the chair near the altar is of Jacobean style and the wooden lectern is made up from various different pieces. Another saintly connection this church has is with the, with the martyr St. St David Lewis, Society of Jesus. The farmhouse at Lower, I don't know how to pronounce this. Uh, uh, George, you got any clues as to how you pronounce this? Uh, C-W-M anyway, so all those Welsh speakers can tell me off for how badly I spoke it. Was, was home to the secret college of Jesuits established about 1600 and forcibly suppressed by the Bishop of Hereford in 1678. St David Lewis, 1616 to 1679, was a Jesuit Roman Catholic priest and martyr. He was canonised by Pope Paul VI in 1970 as one of the 40 martyrs of England and Wales. He was the head of a Catholic seminary in the parish of Lanrothel. He was arrested on the 17th of November 1678 and later condemned as a Catholic priest for saying Catholic masses and, and for saying Catholic masses. He was accused of attempting to kill Charles II and trying to restore the Catholic faith in the land of Wales as part of what was called the Popish Plot. He was sent to London to be examined by Titus Oates, the, fa the fabricator. He was sent to London to be examined by Titus Oates, the fabricator of the Popish Plot 
He was sentenced to death on the 27th of August 1679 and he was hanged and then posthumously disemboweled, which is a pretty gruesome way to go. His last words were, I speak, were, were, I speak not as a murderer, thief or such like malefactor, but as a Christian and therefore am not ashamed. We could do an entire lecture on the Popish plot and Titus Oates, but to say that Titus met his downfall after the death of at least 15, but it is to say that Titus met his downfall after the death of at least 15 innocent people. On the 31st of August, 1681, Oates was told to leave his apartment in Whitehall, but he remained undeterred and even denounced the King and his Catholic brother, the Duke of York. He was arrested for sedition, sentenced to a fine of £100,000 and imprisoned. When the Duke of York acceded to the throne in 1685 as James II, he had Oates retired, convicted and sentenced for perjury, stripped of clerical dress, imprisoned for life and to be whipped through the streets of London five days a year for the remainder of his life. The tale doesn't end here, but perhaps we'll try and sort out a lecture on this topic as that's quite a teaser uh, and it sounds like quite a tale. There you go. There's Church of the Week. Um, St John the Baptist, Lan Rothel. Thanks, George. Thanks, Peter. Um, so everyone, we're about to go into question time with our Chief Executive. So if you've got any burning questions that you'd like to ask our Chief Executive, Peter, please do comment away. If we don't have time to answer it this, ask it this week, we'll do our best to get it to him um, in a following week. Peter, one question that has come in is, um, is the CCT going to be taking on more churches in the next year or two? Uh, the, the simple answer to that is yes. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a process as to how we get them through the church commissioners. But yes, there are, there are at least two on their way very shortly, I think, if, if, if it all follows according to the course. But I'm going to leave you in, in suspense as to where those may be. But they're at opposite ends of the country. So uh, it could be an interesting, interesting addition to the church, to the church conservation trust. Thanks, Peter. And um, out of, um, sort of, uh, you know, you've, you've been working at the Trust for some time and our best things that are coming our way, are we seeing the, um, the amount that we're having to spend on um, urgent repairs and sort of primary repairs when a church comes into our care? Um, are, are those costs increasing? Are we seeing larger repair bills? Well, the, the thing is, for years we were saying that um, uh, the average cost of a new vesting to the CCT was about £300,000. And those figures have been skewed recently. Um, we spent well over a million on Gampston, which is one of our new vestings, it's still on site, which we're just finishing off at the moment. And it looks like the ones that are going to be coming our way are um, the new ones that are coming our way, again, are of significant cost and going above that £300,000 average. It's difficult to know uh, why this is the case. Perhaps it's the scale. But certainly one of the new ones we're potentially getting is big, has a big tower uh, with lots of issues associated with it. But uh, on the whole, I think the trend is moving towards not just inflation, but actually uh, the cost of the works, the extent of works needed to the buildings are, are, are more expensive. The problem is if the churches spend too long being closed uh, and not used, then the, 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 the maintenance sometimes suffers for these buildings because uh, no one's keeping a close eye on it. And that's when the, the costs start to mount up. If you get damp into the structure, get water in, you're then at risk from beetle damage and all sorts of things. And uh, the costs can really run away very, very quickly. Thanks, Peter. And one of the things, I suppose, a, a good question to finish on, because you talked about the importance of churches being used. We've talked about that our churches remain consecrated, even though they're no longer used for regular worship. But what kind of um, things can communities do to use our historic churches? Do we let them do? Uh, are we quite flexible in what communities can use churches for? Uh, we're extremely, uh, extremely flexible. I think um, the idea is to keep with the spirit of the building. Uh, you know, obviously, we don't let anyone do anything illegal uh, or generally immoral. That's not the right thing to do. But uh, there's so much you can do in our buildings. We've had beer festivals, gin festivals, music, theatre. You know, they're all great things. Encouraging people to drink tea and eat cake is always a good thing to do as well. Uh, anything they can think of. We're, we're not really constrained uh, in a sense that, you know, there's, there's not much that you can't do. It's more a case of how do we do more exciting and interesting things across these buildings. They're places to bring people together. Uh, and that's the really important thing to remember. These are places of gathering. They're important to everybody really in the community. Uh, they, they tell a story of that place better than any other building. So 
we're uh, we're always on the lookout for good ideas. So if you've got any good ideas about how uh, churches can be used, we're always we're always we're, we're all ears. Sorry, my words are not coming out well today. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. And everyone, that kind of brings us to the end of um, Church of the Week. Um, thank you, Peter, for talking to us about Lan Roffle um, today and for answering those questions. But if you've got questions for our chief executive, please do um, comment away and we'll get those um, sent over to Peter and we'll try and ask them um, publicly um, over the following weeks. Now, again, everyone, a warm welcome. Um, it's nice to see we've got over 400 people live with us so far. So a warm welcome to everyone. Let us know where you're watching from. And again, if you're joining us for the first time, please do um, let us know and let us know where you're watching from um always our lecture was free of charge everyone so if you do see people commenting i see there's been a couple of links um please don't click them um they're always free of charge and we do our best to quickly um remove those links now um in return for these lectures being free there's a couple of things that you can do to show the love back to the cct um please do um everyone share these lectures um do when you see event pages go up do invite your friends and family along to them because it's really great to see such a wonderful um community um sort of supporting these lectures but do also consider supporting our really important work at the trust as peter said there's a couple of churches coming our way this year um and there's going to be more over the coming years so it's really important that we have your support in helping us to um, protect and care for these historic buildings so you can donate through our website um, which is 100 percent secure secure um, and our website is visitchurches.org.uk you can also donate via text so if you text cct to 70331 that will give us a gift of three pounds Finally, and I know a lot of people have taken us up on this offer already, if you become a member with the CCT, um, so membership starts from just £3.50 a month, if you become a member by direct debit, and if you use the offer code at checkout lecture, and that's lecture in capitals, you will get a free copy of this wonderful book by um, Dr Richard Stemp, which is about the secret language of churches and cathedrals. Now Richard, um, just this week confirmed he is doing a follow-up lecture for us, um, which we'll be pleased to know, and I'll be sharing details about with that you with you later on about that but this book is wonderful it's a great compliment to our lectures because it spans so many topics that our lectures have talked about from mosaics in Ravenna right up to the reformation and right up to um, modern day um, Britain so um, as I said if you join us by direct debit from just £3.50 a month and use the offer code lecture we will send you a free copy of this. Now um, I should say that they've been so popular that we've run out of these books so we've commissioned a brand new print run they are being printed at the moment um, they should be delivered in July so we're hoping to get new books out to everyone in August. Finally, um, that's enough from me, I think, for the moment. So I'm going to pass you back to Peter Ed, who's going to tell you a bit more about today's lecture and um, introduce Howard. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, George. Uh, it's so good to see all of you letting us know where you are uh, from all across the world. Uh, it seems, uh, seems great that we're gathering such a collection of interested people from all over the place to come and support our lectures. Now, we're really pleased to have um, Howard Williams with us today is Professor Howard Williams because he's a professor of archaeology at the University of Chester and researches public archaeology and archaeologies of death and memory. Uh, he writes an, an academic an academic blog which has got a great title of Archaeo Death for a bit of kind of drama there and I think if the team are on it they'll put, put up the, uh, the web link to that as we uh, as we go on. Uh, but I think it's well worth well worth a look. Um, Howard's the co-editor of the Offers Dyke Journal and a former honorary editor of the Royal Archaeological Institute's Archaeological Journal uh, between 2012 and 2017. Now his recent books include The Public Archaeology of Frontiers and Borderlands. Now I was quite interested in this so I asked him about this before we started and basically it's bringing together um, the findings from a conference they held with lots of students and things and they were talking about frontiers and borders which is handy because he lives on one as well so he crosses the border between Wales and and, and England uh, seems on a daily basis, well, maybe not over the pandemic, between Wrexham and Chester, where he goes. But what was really good about this is so uh, researching things like Hadrian's Wall and Offa's Dyke uh, and more recent things in, in, in Ireland as well. But he also included the Game of Thrones uh, in this in this uh, in this as well it was a concept about public archaeology. I think it's really great and uh, how you bring people together. So I digress slightly, but I thought that was worth telling you. Uh, he's also published uh, Digging into the Dark Ages, Early Medieval Public Archaeologies and Public Archaeology Arts of Engagement. 
and plus many more uh, of which details you can find on his website as well. Uh, I, I'd just like to stress the importance of archaeology as an academic pursuit. This is something really important to help us delve into the past and try and explain things uh, that's happened in society and what we leave behind. It is really, really important. And you couldn't go far wrong by studying archaeology in Chester under, under Mr. Uh, Professor Williams here. So it's with great pleasure I introduce him to you. And I'm really grateful to you, Howard, for giving up your time to do a lecture for the CCT. It's fantastic of you. And uh, over to you. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody. Thank you, Peter. And uh, um, good afternoon. I'm going to give you a little talk about a fieldwork project I did a few years back um, from 2020 to 2012 at the Pillar of Elizeg. And while this is situated in present day Wales, this is a very much of interest to those who are interested in the English church. And, and while this is an outdoors ancient monument, a scheduled ancient monument, it is very much linked to the Christianization of the landscape in the early Middle Ages and the stories we can tell from the fragments of archaeological evidence we have and then th how new explorations can shed further light on them. So I called the paper, uh, my presentation Power and Faith in Early Medieval Britain, uh, excavating the enigmatic pillar of Elizeg, because this is a monument very much a part of a conversion process that spans centuries and very much a process of power and, and conflict in a, a borderland before the borderland, before the march, march of lordships. This was a contested territory um, on the edges of the Welsh uplands between various rival Welsh groups and the emerging power from the 7th and 8th centuries of the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Mercia, uh, which straddled central England from London to the Dee estuary from uh, the Severn to the Wash, so this great sort of central British power. And so this monument is a, it tells us stories about faith, Christian faith, but also political power and military might. And, it, it, and that's the, what I think, how do we dig up faith? How do we dig up power? Well, I think in our excavations, we have shed light on those concepts and more. So with that introduction, I simply want to take you on an in, a, a sort of little journey through uh, my work and thinking, which you can follow up with my publications in your own time, about this enigmatic monument. And it's enigmatic because it doesn't look like a Christian monument. It looks like something else. <laughs> it's a fragmentary monument. There's no church around it. Uh, and so it, it doesn't quite fit into our categories of ancient monuments. And indeed, it's a Cadu protected site close to Valley Crucis Abbey, beautiful Cistercian ruins, and it sits alone on their website amidst prehistoric chamber tombs, medieval abbeys and castles, which are the key tourist attractions for anyone visiting Wales, the icons of the Welsh medieval and ancient past, yet this monument doesn't quite fit into those categories, does it, in terms of its appearance? And so it's a challenge for not only academic research, but also public engagement, trying to get people to understand this monument. Now, let me introduce you the, the bare facts. It's a fragmentary monument known as historically since the 19th century, in fact, since the late 18th century, as the Pillar of Elysee. It's 2.84 metres high. We know it's early 9th century, and I'll explain how we know that. So it dates to um, over, over one, uh, 1,150 years. It's a fragment of a cross shaft set in its original base on a dry stone wall, which a uh, dry stone base, which dates to the very end of the 18th century and on early 20th century iron railings on a far older mound. And this is an artist reconstruction, which we'll come back to by Dr. Aaron Watson, an archeologist and illustrator, showing you what it may, may have looked like. We have no idea where the crosshead went. And it's situated near the later Cistercian Monastery of Valley Crucis, that mean the Valley of the Cross. In other words, the cross is probably, this is probably the cross that gave the valley its name by the time the Cistercian monks came there at the very beginning of the 13th century. And this is a side valley from the main Vale of Llangollen in Denbyshire, um, which of course see the Vale spills out the River Dee into the Cheshire Plain and then there's a massive loop before entering the sea at Chester and uh, the estuary there. 
And why it's so important is not only because it's a fragment of an early medieval cross, but it's a fragment of early medieval cross that until the um, 17th and 18th centuries still could be legible, Britain's longest early medieval Latin inscription on a monument. And this is the Edward Floyd's trans uh, transcription of the monument, where recent work by Professor Nancy Edwards, my colleague at Bangor University, has proven to be reliable, in al although even at that point it was a fragmentary text. And so this is both a historical document and an archaeological monument together. And today you can hardly see on its western side the traces of this inscription that before acid rain, industrialization, but before damp, further weathering, this sandstone cross still had inscribed on it. It could be, it was legible through the 17th and 18th centuries. And Professor Nancy Edwards, before we did any archaeological excavation, uh, published a paper in the Antiquaries Journal in 2009 ahead of her full publication of, of this monument in her corpus of um, early medieval inscribed and sculpted stone monuments for North Wales in 2013 about the Pillar of Elizeg. And the key points are that, that she confirms from the inscription and, and what it says on it, this is an early 9th century monument on an earlier undated mound. And you can see the, the mound here on which this, this cross is placed, huge mound. Um, it, 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 the text claims land and power through recourse to myth and genealogy, uh, and it's being erected by the current ruler of power, Kungan, to commemorate his great granddad, Elise. And Nancy Edwards argues that this may have been not only a, an expression of faith and royal power, uh, but it was perhaps located as an assembly site, and perhaps even uh, it's the only possible royal inauguration site for the Welsh princes that we have surviving. So this is a monument of, of not only Welsh significance, but of understanding the rivalries between these early medieval um, kingdoms, the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms to the, the, the west, northeast, uh, the, sorry, the east, northeast and southeast, and, and the various different fractions of Welsh kingdoms. And Nancy makes the point, this is my version of what she says, it's a multi-temporal um, commemoration because it evokes the past um, and it does it through multimedia. It does ask, it does invoke, uh, request the, the person who's speaking it out loud. So it suggests this is to do with not reading, but to do with performance, the, the public proclamation of the Latin text. Um, that its stone form may be significant, the mound on which it stands, and its precise choice of location, Nancy argues, are all key to understanding this monument. So it's not just a, 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 a Latin text in a book, it's a monument, and it was intended to project out a message to a wide audience by being placed in a prominent location. And that's what we knew up to 2009. Um, but there were still many unanswered questions. And so led by, inspired by Professor Di, the late Professor Di Morgan Evans in particular, in collaboration with Nancy and also with uh, Bangor based uh, prehistoric archeologist, Dr. Gary Robinson and myself, we put together a fieldwork project uh, on this scheduled, i.e. protected ancient monument. And with the support of CADU, the landowners, and um, local people, we conducted three seasons of excavation, both to reveal the mound to see what was there because no one had ever done it before. There had been the rumor recorded in the, um, at the very early 19th century that skeletons had been found in the mound. And there's a bit of a sort of apocryphal story of, of, of a, gilded, a, a skull being gilded and reburied in the mound. And no, we didn't find any gilded skulls, but you know, there was that, there was these sort of semi-folklore, semi-antiquarian accounts of discoveries when they were re-erecting the pillar because it had fallen down. Um, but uh, no modern archaeological work had been done on this nationally and internationally important early Christian monument. Um, so we pulled together and it was a tough job. It required it was it needed a sort of an Avengers team of different archaeologists teaming up to make the case to even touch this monument, given it is unique and given that it has never before received anything other than a bit of conservation work. 
And so there's some aerial views of our excavations uh, in uh, 2011 and 2012 uh, down below. This is the, two, the first excavation we did in 2010. And then we opened up the eastern side of the mound in different stretches in 2011. And then 2012, we came back um, for another season of excavations to finish the job. And we weren't trying to dig up the actual cross. As you could imagine, that would be a pretty dangerous thing to do. And we had obviously uh, advice from structural engineers because we had to come quite close to the base of that very heavy uh, stone cross shaft and base. But we were trying to understand this mound upon which the cross was standing. And this is our final season of excavation photograph showing you that what we uncovered was the mound is a classic example of a North Walian multi-phased curved cairn that dates to the early Bronze Age. So the, the, the sort of the, the end of the third millennium BC and the beginning of the second millennium BC. So it's, it's thousands of years older than the Middle Ages. It's, it's much, much older mound. And it's been preserved so well, in part because in the ninth century, someone stuck a cross on it and therefore it took on a new meaning and significance. Whereas other mounds of this nature that would have peppered the valley ridges and sides have long been destroyed by agriculture. So it's almost like being given a, a new lease of life by becoming a platform for a Christian cross. And we found various traces of, um, of, of the uh, of burial kists. And you can see here, there's a, 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 a kist grave, a stone box there, another one there, and another one here. This one had been disturbed and emptied, and that may have been one of those that was found by antiquarians. Um, this one um, was um, um, disturbed, but this one down here was intact and contained cremated human remains dating back to that early Bronze Age phase of the monument's use, where it would have been a, a, a curbed cairn, perhaps built up over multiple stages. Incidentally, this is be slightly before the advent of the drone age, and this is me standing on a very precarious uh, photograph tower and uh, hoping I don't fall off onto those spikes. That would have been very messy and uh, health and safety would have not uh, been happy with me and my uh, actions if that had happened. Anyway, let's move away from such grisly possibilities that never took place. Uh, and uh, this is a, another view of our excavation showing you these, these burial kists. And at one level, this is a typical early Bronze Age monument, but it's confirming a long held speculation that the this early Christian monument raised by a king or a prince of powers to his great granddad, evoking mythological myth myths and legendary figures going back to the Roman emperor Magnus Maximus was actually situated on an ancient mound. Of course, in the early Middle Ages, they wouldn't have known it was early Bronze Age. We came up with the term early Bronze Age in the 19th century. They would perhaps, though, have understood that this was a far older ancient monument. And here's the cairn uh, under investigation as part of our, our work. And this is some of the burial kists that we discovered. And so we, our excavations actually found a new evidence and confirmed speculations that this was a prehistoric curved cairn. And this is some of the evidence we had, a bone pin and a, and a flint blade from the biggest intact cremation um, um, deposit. And so it was, it was clear that in the ninth century, the, this, this unique monument was raised and with this Latin text inscribed on it either at the same time or slightly later on an ancient burial mound and were they trying to claim that past that ancient past as their own i won't go through the text in detail this is the um nancy edwards uh, um, version of the uh, edward floyd transcription uh but kungan and it's a it starts with a genealogy and then there's some fragmentary claims of military victories by Elizeg, the great grandfather, claiming back land, perhaps against the Saxons, against the, the Mercians, and then evoking a whole genealogy back to Magnum, Maximus of Britain and uh, Guathigern, who is a, a, a ver one version of the character Vortigern, we know uh, from other early medieval sources, and says that Conmarch represented pictorially this writing at the demand of the King Cungan. Um, blessings on Lord Kung, uh, upon Cungan and likewise for all of his household and upon all of the province of Powys until until probably the end of time until the last judgment. So so we, we have this a Christian monument honoring the, the princes of Powys and their genealogy, but also their connection to legends to to the Roman Emperor Magnus Maximus to uh, Guathagern. And they're all put into this it's almost like a 
um, a melange story of, of early Powys origins, which must have been fictitious then, as it would be watching The Crown today on TV, or indeed any um, sort of um, sort of comedy, sort of semi semi sort of fantasy mashup of different periods we find in the Game of Thrones or something like that. So different eras, different ideas put into a fictional world. They are creating a fictional origin for their kingdom. And I've st uh, stylized that in this way. It's almost like a spiral of time where the text begins with the commemorator, goes back to the mythical past, the genealogical past, and then goes forward to Judgment Day. So this is a monument that is a powerful statement of faith. It's a cross that may be a, a, may have been a, um, a trying to sort of articulate a faith, perhaps also through its text and its form, Nancy Edwards suggests a land claiming, but it's also um, has different scales of literacy that maybe the names would have been visible and understood, even if you weren't fully literate. Maybe you were listening to it being performed. There's all sorts of different layers you could have understood and engaged with this monument. And it speaks with reiterate phraseology and proclamation. So one wonders whether this is even mnemonics of a longer poem or longer stories that the listeners or readers would have understood from the text that this is part of a myth making or legend making uh, by honoring the royal subjects of the monument in relation to this distant past. But they of course used a cross, um, which may have been, had Roman allusions, victory cross allusions, and maybe a deliberate statement to counter the Mercians who we know were carving their own crosses in and around their, their rich monasteries in Shropshire, in Cheshire, in, 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 the, in the Midlands, in the, what is now the Midlands. And the Mao, and, and, and you know, there is even the possibility they were reusing, they'd actually taken the cross away and they were reusing a Mercian monument, which is an idea I've, I've raised it in publications. But we also have a mound. They were, you know, this mound meant you had to, it was really high up and prominent. You had to step up to it. It was a platform for proclamation and performance. And perhaps it was even thought of as the tomb of one of the people named on this elaborate and fantastical script. You know, it perhaps is part of what David Petz, Professor David Petz has argued, is a landscape of heroes. This idea that the Welsh in the ninth century were concocting uh, a landscape of graves that were the, the graves of heroes that could be evoked in resistance against the incursions of the, the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Mercia. And it's very much a borderland monument. And Nancy Edwards in her publication makes the point, it's just west of the eighth century linear earthwork, probably already out of date and gone by this point, called the uh, Offa's Dyke. Um, and it was probably con perhaps contemporary with its successor, Watts Dyke, a smaller but still significant monument that runs parallel to Offa's Dyke in the north. And here we can see a close-up map showing its relationship with the later Valley Crucis Abbey. So there may have been an earlier church there. So we have a monument that was then has subsequently become scheduled and seems to be a very complex fragment, but telling us an exciting story about faith and power in the landscape. But a part of its story is the landscape itself. And these views are to give you the sense that it's only by understanding in its landscape context can we understand its full significance. We can't simply just looking at the form and the text. It was intended to be engaged with at a prominent node in the landscape. And that's part of the research I did then after our excavations with Dr. Patricia Morietta Flores as part of the Parsonitz Place project, where we looked at the landscape more broadly. And this is a view looking south. That is the Vale of Llangollen crossing east-west. This is the side valley of the Nantigluizeg. And you can see the mound with the cross um, is situated on a plateau above the river, which runs past the ruins of Valley Crucis Abbey, hidden in those trees down there. Uh, this is just another view looking up northwards. So that was sorry, that was looking southwards. This is looking northwards up to the, shoe, um, the Horseshoe Pass to make the point that this is on a major artery of communications. And a good test for that is the fact that there's even today two pubs in close proximity. Never do an archaeological excavation when there's not at least two pubs within walking distance of your site. That's my motto. And that worked for the Pillar of Elise because and that makes the point this is a historic route. These are historic pubs because it's a historic route. People are drovers and farmers and, and, and other goods are coming up and down this side valley from the Vale of Flangothlan and up from, through those passes. You can go to the Vale of Clwyd and you can go to Chester. So this is like a motorway service station in the early Middle Ages in the sense of 
it being a node of multiple routes connecting. And it may have been had a distinctive acoustics and visibility in this zone where you could gather people for markets, for assemblies, for mis mustering your armies in this little side valley. And uh, we can see that it may be a place of performance on this little sort of ridge. And the stone itself may have been a performance getting it there. The stone to make the pillar may have come from the eastern along the Vale of Flangothlan to get to the pillar. Um, but you can also see from this map how it was connected into powerful centres, not far from the Iron Age hill fort of Casteth Dinis Bran, later to become a, a 13th century Welsh castle, not far from uh, the ruins of the later monastery, which may have been over an earlier Christian site. So this was part of a landscape of power and faith. And uh, Patricia Morietta Flores's GIS analysis, which I won't go through in any detail here, but you can look at our medieval archaeology journal publication from 2017. We look at we actually show this, we demonstrate this in predictive modeling of the main routes that topography allows you to move through the landscape. And while it's in a side valley today, historically, this is the easiest point to traverse the Vale of Llangollen away from the river and also these routes to the north. We also did various hypothetical um, surveillance modeling of how of, of, of the location in relation to its landscape. And the point we came up with was that the Pillar of Elise is actually quite a private little space, but we're easily defended by surveillance from the hills around it. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of secure location where you would want to gather your mark, have your market, have your assembly, have your mustering of your forces before going on campaign. Um, and it would have been overseen and controlled by the view shed from Casteth Dinis Bran. And while it's just out of sight from Casteth Dinis Bran, that hilltop location dominates. This is the land you can see from Casteth Dinis Bran up and down the Vale of Llangollen towards Offa's Dyke and the slightly perhaps later Watts Dyke that block the valleys that the enemies of Powys were, were trying to block in this valley um, as they were trying to control this frontier landscape. So Elysee's Pillar may have been a contemporary with this later Watts Dyke, an early 9th century monument, perhaps based on radiocarbon dating and um, optical luminescence dating, um, optical stimulated uh, luminescence dating, sorry, uh, where, from, from Gaboan, where we think this linear earthwork was built by the Mercians after the Age of Offa in the early 9th century. So these very different monuments are facing off against each other in the landscape. The Mercian power base building these huge linear earthworks that the, the, the smaller, more fragmentary kingdom of Powys erecting a Christian cross in defiance. And so we do feel that these, these um, Patricia and my work was able to show that the landscape spoke the story of the pillar, that it was in, in a side valley, but a, a strategic location in military and communication terms in relation to the Mercian kingdom. So we think that this is an important monument. It was a monument raised by an early Christian king, um, honoring his great grandfather. It performed a multimedia role using, celebrating the martial victories of past and present on a prominent landmark, evoking the past of a Bronze Age barrow and perhaps a site of inauguration and an assembly. And through my work with Patricia, we were able to suggest that it was really at a key location in the Welsh landscape. Now, there's more I could tell you about the story of this in that enigmatic monument, because um, the story doesn't end with the ninth century. The kingdom of Powys doesn't survive the ninth century as an independent kingdom. Mercia doesn't survive the ninth century. The enemies of Powys, it's Powys don't survive the ninth century thanks to the Vikings. And the world moves on. But the pillar survived to give the name to the valley, to become the ancient cross in Jarl in the 15th century poem um, of Gitter Glynn, uh, written at Valley Crucis Abbey, to become a monument, an antiquarian wonder. It was on the first tourist trails to come through um, from, from continental visitors to, to Wales and uh, during the Grand Tour. Um, this was on the, the high, one of the major routes. So all of the great um, sort of um, artists and travelers and of the 19th, 18th and 19th century visited the Pillar of Elysee. It became a scheduled ancient monument. And as with so many of our monuments in today's world, it's almost like 
it's entered a sort of shadow existence of no one knows what to do with it. It's a bit too nationalistic to be seen as a beacon of Welsh identity. It hardly exists as a Christian monument because it doesn't have a cross left on it. And so it's, it lives a kind of strange, ambiguous life in our modern 21st century world. A, a unique monument, an enigmatic monument, but a monument with many stories to tell. And that's part of my work ongoing at the moment is to is to we're, I'm working with my colleagues to write up a monograph uh, about the academic findings. But also there's an ongoing studies I've been doing with colleagues to try and sort of re-energize the story of this monument and its landscape context. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Howard. Um, the question, there have been lots of questions and lots of comments coming already. Um, I'm just going to. Um, and um, your screen sharing, if that's so. Yeah, great. thank you. Um, bear me a second. Um, so, there we go. Um, so yeah, everyone, um, we're about to go into question time. So if you've got any questions, please do um, comment away. Um, now's your time to um, put your questions to uh, Professor Howard um, Williams. And um, yeah, um, before we get that, if you've enjoyed this lecture, please do consider um, making a donation you can text donate so you can text cct to 70331 to give a gift of three pounds or you can take um, advantage of our new membership offer so if you join us by direct debit from just three pound fifty a month and use the offer code um offer code lecture in capitals you'll get a free copy of this wonderful book by dr richard stemp now i should also um say that um uh, you'll get this in August when they arrive in stock, but um, we've got our brand new um, exclusive member only lectures, which are starting in a couple of weeks. So we'll comment um, a link there, which will take to our website. Um, and that will tell you a bit more about some of the really, um, up, really interesting upcoming lectures coming up. Now, um, Howard, um, as I said, there's been quite a few questions coming in already. So I'm just going to dive straight in with some of them. Who was it, do you think, because um, you talked about the inscriptions, which sadly aren't um, legible anymore. Who were they written for and who could have been able to read it? Because was literacy not that very good back when it was, uh, you know, who were the people who could have read it? Well, I think the, I, the simple answer, as I said, I did allude to, I skipped over it. But, uh, the point I would make first of all is that uh, we think there would have been a, a, a widespread clerical and monastic uh, literacy as well as the, the royalty themselves. Uh, but I think this is really for public utterance. This is for, it does actually say whoever speaks this out loud. And that's why the landscape context is so important. The platform created by the reuse of the Bronze Age burial mound and that, that zone, that acoustic zone of a sort of side valley, that you could gather thousands of people there and still be heard if you were speaking on that mound. And I added the idea that maybe it's not just the words on the monument, but that these are prompts for bigger storytelling. So you could imagine um, that this is a performative monument uh, where it's not so much important like a modern visitor to a monument, you go up and you just say there, I can't quite make it out. You, you are listening to this oration and that this may have been happening at particular moments. Royal inauguration is one possibility. Um, another one is just a seasonal gatherings for, for, for assembly, for legal assembly, for legal process. Um, for court hearings, in other words, or um, for markets. So this, this monument could have sat there as a beacon, a sentinel in the landscape and become a focal point, an open air focal point for preaching, but also for propaganda and for gathering economic, social and religious and military functions. You know, it's a, it could be a battle cross where you go there, you know, say your prayers and then off you ride to attack the Mercians. Thanks, Howard. Uh, you know, it's really fascinating all the different possibilities that this cross could have had. Um, uh, when you showed us the pictures, how did you decide where um, to make the trenches? And, yeah. and what, what was the decision making process behind that? Yes, I sketched over that. So basically, the 2010 excavations were heavily managed by Cadu. What would Cadu let us do on a scheduled monument? And the 2010 excavations, we opened up two areas to simply look beneath the turf. That's all we did in the 2010 excavations to see what we had. And that had never been done before. There's a few stones visible that look like a curve on the eastern side, but we confirmed by just opening it up and revealing, you know, no machinery was allowed. We had to do it all by hand that this was a Bronze Age burial mound by morphology alone. And then we, we came back for two seasons on the eastern side, uh, sorry, the western side, 
forgive me, because that was the side that looked most damaged because that was the side that face, faced the historic road. And everyone who visits the mound had been walking up that side. So it looked heavily denuded, damaged. And so Cadu said to us, you can dig there because it's already trashed. You know, you, you, not, you, you know, that's the bit that's damp. It's going to be in peril moving forward. We would like you to dig, salvage what's there and then find what information you can, but don't touch the other surfaces. And I was particularly knocked off by that because I thought the best preserved evidence would be on the northern side um, because a, a med historic track had cut the southern side and the western side. Everyone had been walking up to it for 300, 250 years. But we still got some good results, damaged evidence, but enough to confirm that Bronze Age, that Bronze Age origins. And at the end of your digs, did you put the um, turf back on and just sort of leave it? Or is there sort of some kind of protection work you have to do to protect what's there in case anyone wants to go back and do a future excavation? Yes. So we, we put in Tarim at the point where we got to to protect the layer where we, we didn't intervene. As you see, we didn't go down. The monument would have fallen on top of us and it would have been a very miserable end. Uh, but you know, we went down as far as we're safe, and we confirmed our evidence. Put down layers of, of of membrane to stop, you know, so we know where it got to. But then, with the help of every season, with the help of the Cadu conservation team, we had to rebuild, recover over the turf. I mean, we did most of the work ourselves. I said, and I did. I, I'm an active digger. Well, at least I was last then, so I helped with my students. We couldn't use the machinery; but we had to do it all by hand. But then. Um, Cadu have redirected the path around the other side. So actually that's a blessing and a curse. It means many people don't know you could actually walk onto the mound because they can't see the stile. Uh, they put a fence around it to protect it from the sheep and other livestock. Um, but it does mean that, that that delicate side is protected for future generations now. Thank you, Howard. And um, one of the questions I'm just looking at here, um, you, you talked about some of the graves you had found um, yes. on the site. And I, th I want to say this right, it's a kist grave. Yes, uh, uh, C-I-S-T, so kist as in a sort of stone box, yeah. Um, someone's asked, um, could you explain a bit more about what a kist is? Yes, a kist is simply a stone box. We talk about, uh, in, in archaeology, what a kist is are basically a, a set of slabs to create a container uh, for human remains and in prehistory we find these being constructed in any area where they're, they're locally available stone slabs and we find them being used for inhumation for um, unburned bodies in prehistory that tends to be crouched individuals but not always and we sometimes call those short kists um, and, and for cremated human remains but into the early middle ages we have what are called long kists which are constructed for inhumed individuals that are extended so you may hear the phrase in the literature, long kissed cemetery. It simply means a body shaped stone coffin or box into which the dead are placed. Thanks, Anne. And um, when we're looking at, um, someone's made a comment that, um, was the pillar, pillar also a recognition of a, uh, a ruler's right to rule? That is to say that if the descendant of so-and-so raised this cross, it proves their right to kingship. Yeah, you see, this is the interesting thing is I think at one level, uh, in one sense, we have to, we, we're looking at a failed monument that, you know, we have to remember to us, you know, we've got to remember the perspective of people at the time. Monuments are built for aspirations of what they want to be. And that's true of churches. That's true of uh, you know, statues to people we like to honour um, in our age. Statues are about aspirations for future memory. And I think this cross was just that, that they hoped this would be a dynasty that would last forever. And of course, we know it didn't. It was absorbed into the kingdom of Gwyneth, which rose to power in the late ninth century and became the prominent North Walian power. Powys was absorbed into that kingdom. Um, but I think their aspiration was that they were trying to establish a kind of din dynastic presence in the landscape when they were under great pressure from their rivals, particularly the Mercians. And, um you mentioned, um, we talked, obviously, all well, that remains now the pillar and the cross yeah. topping isn't there. Do we know what happened to it what, yeah. in recent antiquity that the topping was lost? I, I skipped over that. We know the pillar fell down in the early 17th century. Either it was an earthquake, we have earthquakes and, you, and lightning strikes, something like that, or um, Puritans ripped it down. There's much evidence throughout Shropshire and Cheshire of Puritans in the early 17th century attacking papist paper you know representations of 
so so we've lost most of our, our our crosses and there's a cross fragment found recently near Tarvin in Cheshire that is evidence of that iconoclasm they actually have buried a cross of I think it's a 10th century cross but it was buried in the 17th century so we may have that so it was lost broken pulled down um and, and then the fragments were restored and there's a whole wonderful story i could tell you about that restoration because there's another inscription on the other side by the local squire who put in latin text almost like a modern sort of i put this up and he i restored it you know so there's another story there uh, but if, in simple terms it was pulled down by either human action or natural causes and lay at the base of the mound for a century or 80 years and was did the Puritans cause any damage? Do we know, or any deliberate sort of um, trying to destroy any of the inscriptions on the on the monument? Yeah, good point. I mean, it was a damaged and worn inscription, but no one's been able to conclusively see evidence that isn't weathering. But no, they don't seem to have done that. Thanks, Howard. And um, I'm just looking at some other questions coming in here. Um, uh, oh, sorry, we, we talked about that one. Um, talking about some of the trackways that go um, past it. Um, would it have been the case that um, certainly when the abbey was um, uh, it, it sort of still in existence, do you think the abbey took ownership of the cross and sort of uh, if people went to the cross, they would pay their dues and sort of make a offering at the abbey? Almost, almost. We don't know for sure. And what we'd hoped actually, you know, is to find some clues from our excavations of late medieval activity at the monument because at one level it's a 9th century cross another level it's a 12th century cross a 13th century cross a 14th century cross so it stayed and that's one of the, this i have to impress for listeners how rare this is or for viewers how rare this is to have a cross most of our early medieval stone sculpture has been trashed moved around pushed into a church it never was at originally you know it's, it's circulated around the landscape this seems to be its original location and it seems to be because it was venerated now what you know that that latin text could still be read in the 12th century and we do think that the the, the emergent late medieval king um, princes of powis were perhaps looking back to this cross as an ancestral monument thanks Adam. And I'm, i i think there's been a couple of comments coming in about um clement so i'm really sorry i can apologize he's he's a very lazy dog um and he always sleeps so sorry oh, he's all right he's helping um what were the impacts do you think of nordic what, uh, sort of a Nordic influence, Scandinavian sort of a, during the early parts of sort of Celtic Britain. Do you think that had an impact on why this cross was put here and the way it was made? You see, that's a really good question, because if you weren't anywhere else other than Wales, the early ninth century would be the Viking Age. And we'd be talking about, you know, Scandinavian influence. But this seems to be, I mean, Wales is different. And I, I mean, there is, well, there is Scandinavian settlement, particularly on Anglesey, around the D, D, uh, the D estuary. Um, there is influence, but uh, the, there's this, these, they, they, there doesn't seem to be any significant Scandinavian settlement into the Welsh in, in, um, you know, interior. So uh, in terms of this monument, this is kind of, before you'd expect any Scandinavian influence on Christian art, which comes sort of 80 years, or 50 to 60 years later. Um, so yeah, it, not, not much in terms of this monument story, but there are some other wonderful monuments such as the cross at Minor Quiven, which may be a century later, up in Flintshire, which is another rare example surviving its original location, which does show evidence of Scandinavian style, artistic, stylistic influence. And when we look at sort of particularly Wales in particular, some, and I'm thinking about some of the places maybe on Anglesey, some of the um, more Celtic ancient um, sites of um, monastic use, would this cross have formed part of a pilgrimage network, sort of as a stop of location to go to those more rural sort of um, secluded acts of Christian worship? Well, this is an interesting point. I don't think we have that, that information, uh, but I think given the fact that I've argued it is on such a key node, that is that has to be a component. I also think that we, we have to remember that most of what we understand about early early medieval Wales is Christianity is heavily skewed towards the northwest and certain parts of the south. This northeast corner, I think, was very much looking to lost lands to the to the to the east. And and I think one of the things that they made symbolic about this location is that it, it looks close to the lost. Uh, great monastery of Bangor on Dee that, that, that is, would have then was in territory that the Welsh had taken from them and the Kingdom of Powys specifically had taken from them sometime in the 7th century by the Mercians encroaching. So I think there was very much 
uh, this is very much a borderland monument that's looking eastwards, uh, almost like uh, encountering this encroaching Mercian dominance. And uh, the, talking about the cross um, specifically, are there examples um, sort of throughout history where it's referenced in the ancient manuscripts at all? Yeah, so we have it from uh, we have it mentioned called the ancient cross in Yale or Yarl, which is the district of of, of this area, uh, which obviously gives its name to the the more famous Yale through Eli Yale, whose uh, uh, rather uh, notorious slave owning uh, tomb is in St Giles Churchyard uh, in in Wrexham. He's a uh, one of these characters. Uh, but yeah, so the the district of Yale is an upland district, and so we know that it's being called that. It's just called the ancient cross by the 15th century. So we have a few late medieval monastic references to this monument and the place name. Thanks Howard and um, going back at sort of actually because we've talked about it sort of built on a Bronze Age site yeah. um, in early Christianity and certainly when Christianity first comes to um, the British Isles we know there are examples where wooden crosses were erected on acts of pagan worship. Is there a way uh, a possibility that the um, site itself before the cross was put up may have been used for um, uh, other uses um, for non-Christian worship. Yeah, I mean, we really don't know much about immediately pre-Christian, you know, religion. I mean, Wales is becoming exposed to Christianity through the Roman province of Britannia. Um, so we imagine the population are Christianizing through the fourth and fifth and sixth centuries. How, what we're looking at, I mean, Don Morgan Evans in a paper 10 years ago, did actually raise the possibility that these bounds may have had a role in pagan, you know, religion, but we're not really sure what those might be. So I'm, I'm I, yeah, it's possible, but we don't really know. Um, if people want to go and visit the cross, is it free to go and visit? Yes, basically you can park at Valley Cruces Abbey, which is a pay to enter Cadu site, or the pub car park of the Abbey Grange Hotel. They're often happy if you have a pint there, if post COVID, um, I'm sure they'll let you park there and walk a little way along the lane. It's sad though that many people visit Valley Cruces Abbey and gawp at the lovely, you know, Cistercian ruins, which are beautiful. But you can see they're ten a penny across Europe, Cistercian monasteries. You know, you really should be going to see the Pillar of Elise. It's unique. And uh, uh, one question that we've had come in is, um, how often do you get out to um, go and count, conduct um, um, excavations? So I've, uh, in my career, I've done about four, four major sets of excavations, but uh, given the nature of my job and my family and personal commitments, I don't do uh, field work since in the last eight years in terms of excavation, but I have been involved in uh, sort of field observations and survey work to do with the Linear Earthworks, Wattsdyke and Otfersdyke. But I'm, I'm, uh, my colleagues are all active field workers too in different ways and uh, my, uh, my, co my next, uh, my colleague Dr Caroline Pudney is out excavating a Roman villa uh, just outside Wrexham in uh, September. So um, between us we do a lot of digs here in the Department of History and Archaeology but for me I'm, I'm doing non-intrusive field work. And do you think there might be in the future um, another excavation at the Pillar of Ellisegg? Um, well for the moment we need some new research questions kind of answered the questions that we wanted to I think there's a reluctance because it is unique and that's I mean I don't want to keep, keep going on about that there is no other ninth century cross anywhere in that area at all in the whole of North Wales there's no other conclusive monument of its northeast Wales of its kind so I think there's, there's going to have to be some really good justifications if we're going to do any kind of intervention because remember our excavation is destruction and so no one else can repeat our experiment. So we have to be very careful about any, any work we do. So I don't think so, but you'd have to have some really good questions, some pressing need to go back and excavate it. And it is a burial site. And even in the Bronze Age, we, we, we try not to just ransack burial sites as archeologists, you, know, we, we, you know, regardless of their age, we have to have a really good justification for doing that intervention. And um, uh, again, we're getting more questions coming in, but um, how can we be so sure that there is no doubt that it was a cross? How can we be sure there was no doubt there's a cross? That's a really good question. And there has been a whole argument amongst various art historians about monuments that lack crosses and were they, were they, all, were they actually built, you know, initially constructed as pillars, mentioning no names and places, Bewcastle uh, for the, those who are in the know. Um, and fine, okay. Um, we can't be sure because we don't have that cross, but I think um, both Nancy and myself are pretty convinced from the place name <laughs> that it was called Glynigrois uh, from the 13th century, that if it wasn't this cross, 
then somewhere there has to be another major cross that was famous enough to give the name to the whole valley. And so we really think the balance on evidence and the place name and the form of the monument with parallels elsewhere. Yeah, you can argue that point, but at the end of the day, the likelihood is it was a cross. Thanks, Al. And I suppose we come to the end of our time anyway. So if you've got any burning questions, everyone, do quickly um, comment away if you've got any more questions. But how would you have a particular excavation um, that's been your favourite um, that you'd like to share with us? Well, my favourite ever ex archaeological excavation. Well, I will like, given the audience and given um, the Welsh theme of my talk, I know I respect the fact that I'm, I'm an encroacher from across the border in this regard. I'm going to wave the flag of David Archaeological Trust, St Patrick's Chapel excavation at White Sands Bay. Um, so I'm going to give a recent excavation because they did a wonderful excavation down this St David's and they found evidence of early medieval burials with some fascinating uh, burial evidence on a site of early Christian worship and pilgrimage. So I'm going to wave the, the Welsh flag, but also the David Archaeological Trust flag in this context. And their wonderful excavations. It was important public archaeology as well. They had lots of volunteers, thousands of visitors, and indeed in my book, The Public Archaeology of Death, they present a, a, a chapter about the public engagement they did with this wonderful early Christian site. And everyone, if you'd like to know more about the books that Howe's written, um, we'll comment a link where you can read all of the um, details on our website where we've put a list of them all. Um, someone has quickly pipped in, um, just in the nick of time, with a question. Um, Presumably crosses could have been removed from other cairns. How would we recognise if this may have happened? Yeah. I mean, we, when I said we, we think this is the original location, you, you know, these things can bounce around the landscape and we may be missing that, that fact. And in fact, you know, um, there may be many others where this may have happened. You know, there, there may have been had crosses placed upon them. So and, and most likely most of them would have been in wood, wouldn't they? <laughs> would, wouldn't they? Um, you know, so, yes, I think we're missing just how important this relationship between mound and cross was in the early Christian landscape, which, of course, would have allusions to Golgotha and so many other, you know, this idea of a sort of landmark cross. So I think, yeah, I think it may have been more common than we, we perhaps realise. Thanks, Hal. And thank you, everyone, for your questions today. That's been really, um, it's great to see so many questions coming in. Um, as I said, um, if you would like to support us, you can do that in a few ways. You can text CT to 70331 to give us a gift of £3. You can donate through our website. Or, as I said, if you join us as a member by direct debit from just £3.50 a month, um, we will send you a free copy of um, this wonderful book, Secret Language of Church and Cathedrals. And you just need to use the offer code lecture in capitals, and that will make sure we get the book to you and that will be delivered to you in August. But in the meantime, you'll get your membership pack. Um, we've got the member exclusive lectures that start in a couple of weeks. And we've got some more exciting news to talk about in a couple of weeks or maybe a month's time um, in regards to some exclusive film content we're going to make available for our members. Um, but everyone, thank you so much for joining today. Um, we are hoping next week we are going to switch off from Zoom onto our new platform Vimeo. So keep your eyes peeled because tomorrow we're going to be doing a test and we're going to be talk doing a quick presentation about something at the CCT that we do called Champing, which is camping in churches. So keep your eyes peeled because um, it'd be great to get your feedback because if that all goes to plan, um, yeah, next Thursday we'll be switching on to Vimeo, which will solve a couple of the problems people have faced today. And then the following week, um, the lectures will also be available live on Facebook and on YouTube. But I'll put a post out on Facebook um, explaining how that works. It, it won't make much of a difference in how you join the lectures, but it'll make the whole process a lot better and more enjoyable, hopefully, for you all. But comment away, everyone, with ideas and suggestions for future lectures. But Howard, thank you so much for a fascinating lecture and for taking the time to give us free lecture today. Thank you. And great to, great to, not, I didn't get to see anyone, but thank you all for coming. <laughs>